Last week, we taught in life and death, God is always there. We covered verses 4 through 6. I'm just going to look at two, uh, two of them, to, uh, not last week, Sunday. Uh, we're just going to cover the last two tonight, verses 5 and 6, where we spend most of our time on Sunday. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I'll never leave you, leave thee, nor forsake thee. And um, we brought out on Sunday that that was a promise he gave Moses and a promise he gave Joshua. When Moses uh, died and Joshua took over the leadership of the uh, Hebrews, God gave the same promise he gave to Moses that he gave uh, to Joshua. I mean, the same promise he gave to Moses he gave to Joshua. And that was, I will uh, never uh, never leave you nor forsake you as I was with Moses so shall I be the, with thee no one will stand against you so we don't have that whole promise in the New Testament we have one could argue the important part maybe not the exciting part but the important part and that's that God will never leave us nor forsake us And so what we talked about on Sunday was because we have that promise, we may boldly say something. If we believe God tells the truth, then because God told the truth when he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that gives us the courage to boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, you see, there's the curveball where it leads Moses and Joshua. Moses and Joshua's promise was no man will be able to stand against you. Our promise is there'll probably be some people who stand against us, but God will be with us in that, no matter what man shall do unto us. So we got the important part of the promise, but we're not leaders of a nation where God is telling us that uh, no one will be able to stand against us. Um, They stood against Paul, they stood against Peter, they stood against all the disciples, the apostles. Uh, John the Revelator uh, spent a great deal of time on a prison island. Um, They all suffered. as uh, Most of them died martyrs' death. Um, They tell us, uh, we don't have a record of all of it, but tradition, which uh, means when you're thinking in Bible terms, tradition is what was handed down from generation to generation. And it appears that every one of the apostles that Jesus walked with Jesus and then add Paul, every one of them died a martyr's death except John. And they tried to kill him. They boiled him in oil. But God wasn't through with him yet, so they couldn't kill him. So they threw him on a prison island and God met him there and he wrote the book of Revelation. And not only that, I read a commentary just recently that believes, no, I think it was Chuck Swindoll on the radio, uh, who believes every book John wrote was on the Isle of Patmos, which uh, would have been the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. So, I believe it was Chuck Swindoll, who knows a thing or two. And I believe he was the one that that is convinced that John did all of his writing, uh, those writings that have become part of Scripture, did all of them while prisoner on an island. So even the first century apostles did not have the whole promise of Moses and Joshua. They didn't have that one part, no man will stand against you. Uh, Every one of the apostles had people stand against them, and most of them had people kill them. But the promise is, whatever happens, he'll never leave us. And it just really overwhelmed me when I was looking at this um, a couple weeks back, when I was looking at this area of Scripture. It overwhelmed me. We didn't get the part that no man can stand against it but we got he'll never leave us and I realized 
when I read that. I, I always knew it, but this kind of made it fresh. The minute I close my eyes in death, he's there. He is literally not going anywhere any time. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. So, when I close my eyes on my, in, on my deathbed and my wife breaks down in horrible crying or jubilation, one or the other, I, I won't be there to witness it, whatever it is. Uh, on the other side, which I get to the other side the moment I'm dead. <laughs> well, the good news is when I get to the other side, God is right there. And not only is he still there, so he's never left me. Not only is he still there, now I'm going to see him. I can't see him here. I'm going to see him on the other side. So that's the good news. So the promise there was he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And that should give us the courage to say, no matter what's going on in our life, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's what verse 6 says. And then I had some things down below in, in bullet form. So if God has already declared as a fact that whosoever believes in Jesus is saved, then I can boldly declare as a fact that I'm saved. And the fact that verse 6 is giving us permission whenever God tells us something, to say something related to what God told us boldly. And so, God told us, in John 3.16, whoever believes in Jesus is saved, so I can boldly declare, as a fact, I am saved. God has already declared as a fact that Christians love other Christians. Then I can boldly declare the fact that I love God's people. I can declare that. Even on days when somebody aggravates me. I can declare by faith in God that I love that person in Christ because God said I did. And uh, so you line your life up with what God said. If God has already declared as a fact that Jesus himself took our infirmities, bare our sicknesses, took all of our skin cancer away, made ugly people handsome. No, I guess he didn't. <laughs> I can hope. Uh, himself took our infirmities and bare his sicknesses, our sicknesses, and I can boldly declare the fact I am healed. If God has already declared the fact that he will supply all my needs, then I can boldly declare the fact that all my needs are supplied. That's what we needed to take away from Sunday's lesson. All right, now on to Tuesday night's lesson. Verses 7, 8, and 9. Verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, con considering the end of their conversation. Barnes says, The remember them, the them is either the apostles or others, respected to be shown to the ministerial office by whosoever it is born. Uh, the Bibli uh, uh, biblical illustrator had something interesting to say. If we would preserve the purity of the faith and manners with our, which our religion requires, we should have frequent recourse to the primitive, primitive teachers and patterns of Christianity. In other words, he's saying, let me put that in words you can understand. If we want to keep our doctrine pure and the way we live for God acceptable, we should... Pay attention to the primitive preachers. In other words, those that God rose up to be the founders of the Christian faith. We should pay attention to Peter and Paul. We should pay attention to James and John and all those guys that wrote Scripture. Um, and we should pay attention to how they live their lives. And we should study their teachings and exemplify the way they live. Follow their examples in the way we live. Who's so likely to deliver... Uh, who's so likely to deliver the faith and doctrines of Christ pure, if we're going to do this, a pure job of that, as the primitive teachers of it, who receded from the Lord himself and were by an extraordinary assistance of the Holy Spirit 
secured from error and mistake in the delivery of it. So what the biblical illustrator is reminding us, the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit and therefore error-free. There are no errors in it. Now, when we start preaching it, the only time what I say is absolutely 100% error-free, error-free is when I'm reading the Scripture to you. The minute I leave reading it and start teaching on it, I hope to God that 90% at least of what I say is accurate. I try to get it all accurate. But we don't have that same divine revelation breathed into it by the Holy Spirit because we're not establishing the church. We're just carrying on the doctrines of the apostle. Um, but we need to remember um, not only how they live, but, but their end, Barnes said. In other words, how they died. This was so important to them, they willingly laid down their lives to get this doctrine out there. All right, now, what does the author, according to the commentaries above, the author of Hebrews, that is, refer to in verse 7? Barnes says, ministers of the gospel in any age. Uh, Clark says, those ministers who have died prior to the writing of this letter. In other words, what uh, biblical illustrator called the primitive preachers. Uh, primarily, the writers of the New Testament. I personally agree with the biblical illustrator here, and here's why. The subject of the previous verses have been that we should remember those who were suffering or had suffered for the gospel, knowing that we might be next. It was the New Testament writers who spoke to us the unadulterated word of God. We see the end of their conversation played out in Scripture or handed down through Christian tradition. In other words, we see that they died. Every one of the founders, except John, died a martyr's death. Every one of them. And so, when you understand that, you see how they believed it. People say, you know, the, the, the skeptic said, Jesus never resurrected from the dead. Some Jews stole his body. Well, you have two questions then. If that's true, how come the mighty Roman army couldn't find the body? They wanted it silence. They wanted this Christian sect, SCT, S-E-C-T, I mean. They wanted it ended. They could have put all the resources into finding the body if it, if it was just stolen. But secondly, if the body was just stolen and Jesus never resurrected, why was every one of these, using their word, primitive writers of the Scripture, willing to die for it? Would you die for a hoax? If you perpetrated a hoax, would you be willing to die for that hoax? But if it was the truth you were saying, nobody is going to move you from that truth, whatever it might be. All right, so, verse 8 at the bottom, the very last sentence on the first side, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And um, so you flip it over, and the top sentence on the back side is the Young's literal translation of that verse. Jesus Christ, yesterday and today, the same, and to all the angels, or ages, I mean, all the ages. Jesus never changed. He is who he's always been. Even when he clothed himself with flesh, he was still who he's always been. He is, a, he is unchanging God. All things that are created were created by him. John chapter 1 tells us there's nothing that was created that wasn't created by him. So, Jesus has never changed. He is who he's been for eternity. And as unchanging as Jesus is, so is his doctrine. Jesus came to take away our sins. That's an eternal doctrine. If we put our faith in Christ, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life was written before there was ever a universe. 
It's an eternal doctrine. The plan of God has been forever. When my son dies, any sinner who trusts him as Savior will have their sins removed and will be guaranteed heaven. That's a pretty good deal. And if Jesus is on changing, why is he putting that here? Let's not be changing doctrines. Let's stay steadfast to the solid teaching of the New Testament. <coughs> rightly divided. And I say rightly divided because some people take a verse here and a verse here and a verse here and make a doctrine that doesn't fit it. That's why I like to go verse by verse by verse to keep what I'm saying in the context in which it was meant. You could, you know, somebody, uh, just to prove the danger of just taking a verse here and a verse here to make a doctrine, one verse said, and Judas went out and hung himself. And another verse said, go thou and do likewise. I don't think I'd want to make a doctrine out of that. So uh, we want to keep the verses in their context and understand that what God believed before the world was, what God believed when Jesus was walking this planet, he believes now. And it's not, that's humanly speaking. There is a sense in which God doesn't believe anything. He knows everything. Sometimes when we say we believe, we're saying there's, there's a, a tint of doubt there. We might not be able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. So, when I say God believes, I'm speaking as a human. God simply knows. And what He's known is eternal, and it doesn't change. So, just because the world we're living in is changing, we as Christians should not. Just because the woke generation is saying, no, no, that's wrong, you can't say that. If it's in there, we got to say it. We have no... Alternative: We must say the truth of God. And so we don't get to change with the winds of time. And man, are the winds of time blowing right now. Changing everything I believed as an American growing up. None of that's the same anymore. Parents can't spank their kids or they're abusive. Parents don't have the right over what their kids are taught. It takes a community to raise a child, not a parent. Just, that's all brand new, folks. That's all brand new. And it's not staying to the truth of the Scripture. All right? Now, look at verse 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. That's the King James Version. The contemporary English version is right under that. Don't be fooled by any kind of strange teachings. It is better to receive strength from God's undeserved kindness than to depend on certain foods. After all, these foods don't really help the people who eat them. So what, what's he getting at here? One of the doctrines in the New Testament was uh, there were certain things you couldn't eat. Now, there were more. It wasn't just one issue. For example, there were the Judaizers who wanted to marry Moses to Jesus. They say you're saved by faith in Christ, but you stay saved by obeying Moses, keeping the law. And eating meats there would have implied eating the Jewish diet when they were under the law. There were certain kinds of animals they could not eat. And um, why do Christians and New Testament Jews eat those meats now that they couldn't eat in the Old Testament. Because God was about to do something amazing one day, and Simon Peter was visiting a man, and he said, I need to go up on your rooftop and get alone with God. And he goes up on the rooftop, 
And God slays him in the spirit, we would say today. He fell into a trance. And he has a vision. And there's this huge sheet. And it's being held up by four corners. And it's filled with every kind of animal that was unclean under the law of Moses. Every one of them. And God says, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, I've never eaten unclean food. And God said, what I've cleansed, don't call unclean. There's a due purpose there because the law is no longer in effect. The Jews are no longer uh, bound by the dietary habits that they had under the law. But that was only the secondary thing. The real thing God was getting at to Peter. Peter, if someone's going to be knocking at your door soon, he didn't know that at the moment. They're not Jews, they're Gentiles. They're going to want to take you to a centurion's house. Go with them. And so, sure enough, Peter gets out of the trance. The, the sheet's gone. The vision's over. There's a knock at the door. And his host said, Peter, some people are here to see you. And Cornelius was the centurion. That, that's an uh, officer in the Roman army. And he sent some people to fetch Peter to come to his house because he had been to Jerusalem and had been influenced by the preaching of the gospel and he wanted to hear more. So God was really, the main point he was saying is, they'll tell you in the Jewish community, Peter, that you only preach to Jews. Don't you call on Queen what I've cleansed. I'm about to clean up a whole bunch of Gentiles. You go to their house. Jesus had told Peter when he was still here. He said, Whatsoever you loose shall be loosed. Whatsoever you bind shall be bound. And many commentators believe what he was talking about was Peter was going to be the first one to preach the gospel to the Jews. He did on the day of Pentecost and to the Gentiles. And he did in Cornelius' household that day. Paul was a bit of a renegade. I think some of the Christians would have had trouble with Paul being the first guy to preach to Gentiles. So God used Peter. And because Peter shared his vision with the other apostles and they knew he was very trustworthy, they all understood the grace of God was now being extended outside the Jewish family into the non-Jewish community. So Peter preached that day uh, in Cornelius' household, and they had a Pentecostal experience. Interrupted his sermon with speaking in tongues, uh, right in the middle. Can't be any ruder than that. Um, what the guy finish? But why that was important on the day of Pentecost when the Jews received the Holy Spirit when he came to actually live in people. How they all, they had the tongues of fire and they all spake with tongues. And I think why that was so important in Cornelius' household. Peter had to understand they got what we got. God's got to be in this thing. And from that day on, true preachers of the gospel do not call Gentiles on queen. Or I would say in our day and age, we don't call anyone on clean or anyone beyond the reach of the gospel. The worst sinner can get saved if he gives his life to Christ. So, verse 9 is telling us, don't get carried away with these things like what meats to eat. The other meat issue of that day was there were good Christians who didn't want to buy meat in the marketplace that had been the animal had been sacrificed to an idol. They thought that meat is uh, now stained. It is no good. I'm too good a Christian to eat it. Other Christians thought that idol is nothing but a piece of wood or a piece of gold. There is no other God but ours. 
There's nothing there to defile that meat, and it's cheap. And so they bought it. And so that was one of the things that Paul had to deal with in his teaching. Should I eat meats offered to idols or not? And in uh, Romans 14, he went so far as to say, uh, He that is weak, eateth not meat. Um, he that is strong, eateth all things. Another place he didn't answer the question. Uh, when he was talking about eating meats offered to idols, he said, We all... I forget the exact wording, so I'm going to put it in my own words. We all don't know uh, we have knowledge. We think we know more than the other guy. He said, knowledge puffs up. Charity edifies. Quit bragging about what you know and love some people. But that was the issue of some people thought, no, don't tell me we can eat that defiled meat. Others thought a hamburger is a hamburger. Put a little cheese on it, and you got you something. And uh, so that was an issue. And uh, certainly Paul um, seemed to side, when you read the commentaries, and I certainly agree, seemed to side, uh, side with those who said, there is no other God, so there's no, no God to defile that meat. They're just a bunch of idiots that are worshiping wood, or worshiping gold, and killing animals. And then they're getting rid of the meat, selling it cheap. And so a lot of Christians bought it. So Paul's, I mean, the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, don't get caught up with those silly arguments. Don't get into all kinds of things that don't edify anyone. Um, and that's why he brings out meat here. He said, be established with grace, not with meat. Don't draw the line in the sand about what to do with meat. Draw the line in the sand, you're saved by grace, grace alone. Grace plus nothing. Well, grace is actually the doctrine of faith plus nothing. You put your faith in Christ, period, you're saved. That's the doctrine that you got to hold on to. Now, there were a lot of... Um, well, I'm going to jump down here. Um... My wife gave me a kiss. Galatians 1, 6 to 9, down toward the bottom. I'm going to remind you of what Paul said that goes along with verse 9 up there. Paul said, and this is the beginning of his letter to the Galatian church. He had established the church there in chapter 3, verse 1. He's, he said in essence this. What happened to you? I preached the gospel so clearly you had a portrait of words. My words painted a portrait about what the gospel is all about. What is making you waffle? Well, he'd already said something to the same effect in chapter 1. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, so Paul's saying we, my, my team and I, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you up put in parentheses already. He's not there now, but when he was there, he'd already preached the gospel. So he said, if one of my, my team, me or one of my team, or an angel from heaven, not one of the devil's angels, come down and preach to you anything different than what I already preached to you, let him be accursed. We would simply say, let him be cursed. Then he went on. In verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that you have received, let him be cursed. Now, you see there's two, in verse 6, I, I uh, embolden the word another, and in verse 7, I embolden the word another. Those two words are the same in English, they're not the same in Greek. 
the first one is Elos. The second one is Heteros. No, I'm sorry. The first one is um, is Heteros, and the and the second one is Elos. The first one, when he said, "What has made you turn unto another gospel?" That word "another" means another of a different kind. Why have you switched your thinking onto something that is not a gospel and you're calling that a gospel? It's something altogether different. So he said, you've gone on to another gospel of another kind, but then he said, which is not another, and that word means of the same kind. So he's saying, you just left the field. I mean, you're not even in the same field of play anymore. What you're believing now, what the Judaizers are telling you, that you've got to mix works with grace. What you're doing now is you left the gospel behind. You haven't learned more of the gospel. You have moved to something different altogether of a different kind that your teachers call a gospel. But it's not a gospel. And so that's what verse 9 is telling us. We have got to find out and get some understanding what these primitive, I, that's an interesting word that uh, commentator used, what those primitive preachers taught, those first century preachers. We need to get a hold of what they thought, and here we are in the 21st century, and we need to make sure that we in the 21st century are teaching and preaching what they in the first century taught and refuse to be moved from them.